Good afternoon. I'm Francesca Trivellato. I have uh, recently joined the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study on the other side of Princeton. And together with Professor Angela Krager, the Thomas M. Seibel Professor in the History of Science and Director of the Shelby Coleman Davis Center for Historical Studies at Princeton University, I have the really great honor and the enormous pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special event, a celebration of Professor Natalie Davis' extraordinary career as a scholar, a mentor, a movie screen actor, a movie screen writer, I, and for those of you who've seen the poster, as an actress too, and uh, on the occasion of her recent 90th birthday. And it's wonderful to see, and not surprising, to see the room packed on this rainy afternoon for uh, what will certainly be a memorable event. I believe this is the first co-sponsor and co-organized event between the School of Historical Studies and uh, the Davis Center, and neither Angela nor I could think uh, of a more appropriate and happier occasion than to celebrate the inimitable Nellie Zimon Davis. Before passing the podium to Angela, who will be chairing the first of the two sessions of this afternoon workshop, I would like to ask you to join us in thanking the magnificent staff who has attended to every single detail and made possible for us to be here today. They include Jennifer Goldman and Judith Hansen at Princeton University, as well as Alexis May, Marion Zelanzi, Robin Howard, Dario Mastroianni, and the event team at the Institute for Advanced Study. Mary, many thanks to all of them. Hello, I'm the aforementioned, aforementioned Angela Kreger, um, and I just want to pick up by saying a few words about this event. Um, it was very hard to decide uh, who we might invite to pay tribute to Natalie today in celebration of her birthday, and we ended up with a very stellar roster of speakers, all of whom have been uh, colleagues and friends of hers over the, her time at Princeton. Um, it's worth mentioning, uh, apropos of the collaboration, I just learned from Francesca that her very first visit to Princeton was at the Institute for Advanced Study. Is it 19, what's it, 57 or 58? So, um, uh, and then, sh as you know, she returned to Princeton as a faculty member uh, to join the history department from 1978 to 1992. But she actually spent the first um, part of 1978 back at the Institute as a member. It was, were you in social sciences or historical studies? Historical studies. Historical studies. OK. So her own pathway into Princeton was very much through the Institute. And so our speakers today reflect individuals with connections to the Institute as well as the university. Um, she uh, and Natalie was at uh, Princeton's history department from 1978 to 1992, where she had uh, 96. 96, of course, yeah. <laughs> Misprint. Yes, because that's why we overlapped. Uh, I wouldn't have overlapped with you otherwise. But uh, her career at Princeton was illustrious in many different ways, but not least, she was the second director of the Davis Center, succeeding Lawrence Stone, who had been the founding director. Uh, I will just say, as someone who came on to the faculty in 1994, that I admired Natalie tremendously especially in her role as Davis Center Director, but not only there, for her elegance, her erudition, and her tremendous energy, uh, all of which seem to be completely unabated today. Um, our, so our speakers today were not given any particular theme or topic. Was just, each one was just asked to speak for 20 minutes or so, uh, and we'll just introduce them in turn. We will have a coffee break at 3 o'clock. So first up is William Chester Jordan, my dear colleague, the Dayton Stoughton Professor of History at Princeton. He's been teaching at Princeton since 1965. No. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, sorry. I'm working.
reading off the earlier draft of the notes, which we then corrected, and I never got the corrections, so I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, I was busy this morning directing the Davis Center, so I'm really not very prepared for this. Anyway, um, Bill actually succeeded Natalie as the third director of the Davis Center, I think I got that right, where I was an executive serf, as we called it, with him during those years for animals and human society. He also um, gave the Natalie Zeman Davis lectures at Central European University and paid homage to her great book, Women on the Margins, by titling his lectures, Men at the Center, Republican <laughs> Governance <laughs> under Louis IX. Although, as he points out, they were men at the center, but they came from the provinces of France. <laughs> so anyway, I will hand the podium over to him. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Uh, one thing that Angela said uh, is true. Uh, uh, that is to say, Natalie is the most energetic person I've ever met, and she's one of the few people who make me feel lazy whenever I see her. Uh, anyway, the, the, I'm actually going to give a little paper, a mini paper. It's called A Micro History of an Unnamed French Girl, 1267. Natalie Davis has long evinced an interest in singular stories that can, studied carefully, open up vistas on important historical and historiographical matters. This is precisely what she helped to pioneer in her book on the return of Martin Guerre. Uh, some time ago, I came across what I regard as another such story. It's certainly not as rich in documentation as the mysterious tale of Martin Guerre, but as a medievalist, I'm rather more thrilled by this fact than disappointed by it. <laughs> its revelations, even after careful scrutiny, do, don't reach the level of those Natalie uncovered in reconstructing the experiences of either the soldier or the imposter at the center of her research. But there are nonetheless certain interesting implications, uh, I believe. <clears throat> in any case, I decided for this occasion to squeeze the evidence to the extent I can while remaining true to the canons of historical research and to offer my, my reading uh, to this audience, and particularly to Natalie. I hope that the audience's little historical journey, journey with me today satisfies, or even better, that it whets its appetite for all the other gifts the colloquium speakers offer in their remarks to our dear colleague in celebration of her 90th birthday. Now, the evidence comes largely from a court case that has never perhaps received the attention it deserves. The Olim, the medieval records of the King's High Court of Parliament, uh, chiefly relate to jurisdictional disputes and, on petition, defects of justice. Although the rights and privileges of many women might be contested in the proceedings, it was male proctors who pleaded all the cases to the judges in Parliament, frequently providing details on women's lives that historians find valuable. For example, the judges, or as they were more formally known, the masters of the king's court, could be deciding where jurisdiction lay when, say, a physical altercation led to the loss of a life, a, a limb, or a member, like an eye or an ear. If the altercation involved a woman as assailant or victim, the proctors, and subsequently the investigators, might provide in their narratives intriguing particulars that help historians reconstruct the politics and culture of disputes involving women, the social spaces occupied by women of various statuses, and so on. The issue, of course, did not have to involve violence, and the case for which I, I want to offer my microhistory ostensibly did not. The record is in Latin, and I'll first offer a translation. The knight, um, Nicholas de Blainville, now, Jennifer, are the handouts available? Oh, you all have them? Great. OK. The knight, yeah. the knight Nicholas de Blainville, petitioned concerning a certain girl whom the knight, Jean de Tilly, was holding, which girl is Nicholas's relation, though in no way was it appropriate by law that she should be handed over to the said Jean for guarding by her friends. But the said Jean, on the contrary, said that because she was 14 years old, she could, according to the custom of her land, go wherever she wished. And since she wanted to remain with him as the future wife of one of his sons, if the church assents to it, she ought to remain with him and not be placed elsewhere. The said Nicholas denied that there was any such custom. Nevertheless, when the girl was asked about her preference, she said that she very much wished to stay with the said Jean. An order was given to the Bailly of Verneuil to uh, inquire about this custom, summoning the girl's relatives and friends as part of this inquiry. At length, having been informed by the Bailly that he had not found that there was such a custom, 
he was commanded, based on the input of the friends of the girl's mother and father, to transfer her guardianship to another disinterested person. Now, Nicholas de Blainville, who brought the complaint, was most likely the lord of the village of blainville sur orne which is on your map, located in the modern department of the Calvados in Normandy. The lordship was modest at best, but over the years, the seigneurs of Blainville fought loyally on the side of the French in the Franco-Flemish Wars of the 13th and 14th century. Their contribution, however, was overshadowed by that of the lineage against whose member Nicholas brought his complaint, Jean de Tilly. The village of tilly sur seul which uh, gave its name to this lordship, was located less than 20 miles from blainville sur orne Its seigneur, the knight Jean de Tilly, was in fact a banneret, which is to say that he is of a status that entitled him to command a body of knights um, fighting, under, going to battle under his standard or his ensign. He was, in the words of the leading authority on the medieval French army, Xavier Hilary, one of the elite of knights. Members of his family also fought on the French side in the Franco-Flemish Wars. His lordship gave him the right of patronage of the parish church of Coquigny and of Teville, both in the department of the Manche, far enough from the heart of the fief, of his fief, 35 miles and 60 miles respectively, to prove that his influence was not narrowly circumscribed around the village of Tilly. In 1268, a year after Nicholas's complaint, Jean sat as a counselor at the assizes, or sessions of the royal court held in Caen, uh, a mere 10 miles or so from Tilly. It was the same year that the Archbishop of Rouen, Eudes Rigaud, preached the crusade in one of the city squares of Rouen, and then solemnly processed through the streets with relics of Mary Magdalene, relics that the prelate had requested Louis IX to send to the hospital in the city, which was under Mary Magdalene's patronage. Later, priests celebrated yearly requiem masses on the anniversary of the death of Lord Jean de Tilly at this prestigious institution dedicated to Mary Magdalene. He must therefore have been a patron of the hospital. In his lifetime then, this Jean was sufficiently respected to serve as a counselor in the provincial royal court of Caen, which was the seat of the bayage or administrative district of the same name. This was an important position the Kingdom of France was divided at the time into only 20 or so by Age. The whole Duchy of Normandy had only six. Men who sat as counselors in the Assize Courts had to be of appropriately high social status, typically of knight knightly status, knightly rank, and they had to possess sufficient wealth, administrative knowledge, and familiarity with regional customs to be of service to the Bailly. Um, the Bailly was president of the court, that's why he, they had to have that knowledge, that legal knowledge. In the case before us, Jean de Tilly stood accused by a private petitioner, Nicolas de Blainville, of having invoked a custom that did not exist. And the petitioner also charged that Jean had made this claim about this so-called justifying custom in connivance with the 14-year-old girl's friends in order to obtain custody of her. Indeed, Jean did so, according to Nicolas de Blainville's accusation, even though the girl was unrelated to the Lord of Tilly, but was, a com but was a kinswoman of himself, the petitioner. Yet what precisely was the relationship that Nicholas claimed? In the absence of fathers and mothers, or brothers who were of age, the duchy's general custom gave strong custodial rights to uncles, but not to other male relatives like brothers-in-law or cousins. If Nicholas had been the only or even one of many of the girl's uncles, assuming she had any, he would never have had to bring a petition to Parliament, for the lowliest local official would earlier have compelled Jean de Tilly to return the girl to his custody or to that of another uncle. And this hadn't occurred. Indeed, no lesser official or court inferior to Parliament had recognized Nicholas's custodial rights or anyone else's. More than likely, he was only a cousin, perhaps not even a first cousin, Although it's also vaguely possible, if she had a sister, if the unnamed girl had a sister, that he was the girl's brother-in-law and was trying to protect his wife's, or through his wife, his own child's or children's claim to part of the inheritance. In any case, Jean de Tilly, though admittedly unrelated to the girl, insisted that she had freedom of action. She had come of age at 14, he argued, 
And as an orphan, and one certainly without an older brother or an uncle, she could do whatever any unmarried adult woman wished. He added that he knew that she wanted to stay in his home. So was he being truthful, or was the girl being kept in Jean's household against her will? Jean de Cricbeuf, who's also on your list, the Bailly of Verneuil, the administrator and chief magistrate of the Norman Bayage of the same name, was a disinterested party. Unlike Jean Le Saunier, the Bailly of Caen, who presided over the assizes held there and who therefore worked closely with his advisor, Jean de Tilly. It was Jean de Cricbeuf to whom the masters of parliament entrusted the task of investigating, of determining the validity of the custom and presumably of finding out whether the girl was being held under compulsion. Our one hint of her voice is in the defiant retort to Nicholas's accusations embodied in her affirmation of Lord Jean's testimony, of her desire to remain with him that is to say, to stay in his household. Evidently, she disdained returning to her own home or going to Nicholas's, as he had requested the court to direct. So far, so good. But what about the custom? On this point, the Bailly of Verneuil, Jean de Cricbeuf, was noncommittal. His investigation did not turn up independent evidence of the custom, but he was unwilling to say the custom did not exist. So what explains his hesitation? It can't be attributed to jurisdictional confusion. True, as Lord Jean de Tilly insisted quite correctly, the church in its canon law recognized the girl's age at, uh, right at the age of 14 to confirm an earlier pledge of marriage, presumably offered by a parent or parents on her behalf. And it was common for girls betrothed in infancy to make a free will declaration known as present consent at age 14. Although some canonists thought age seven was sufficient. Princess. Marie of France, for example, the daughter of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Louis VII, who was betrothed at birth to Count Henry the Liberal of Champagne, gave her present consent at age 14. However, Lord Jean de Tilly had appealed to a custom of the land, a secular custom, no proof of which the Bailly acknowledged he could find. Such silence in oral and written sources should have been dispositive. If natives could not recall, and if written records did not register the custom, ipsis factis, there was no custom. <laughs> Perhaps Lord Jean was extrapolating from the canon law in the sense that he had obtained a promise from the girl's parent or parents early in her life that at age 14 she could, if she wished to do so, confirm the betrothal to his son. In other words, there may have been no explicit custom of the land that conferred on a 14-year-old girl the right to changing her residence at will, but there was a custom that allowed parents to bestow the privilege of independent action at this age. Indeed, this might have been inferred from the fact that in most regions of northern France, 14 was the age of majority. Just about the only lineages for which coming of age was delayed until 21 in the mid-13th century, and then only for males, was the line of the Counts of Champagne and arguably of the kings of France themselves at least until 14th century legislation established the age of 14 for the monarchs, too. The upshot was that there was a case to be made for and against the custom of the land, until such time as their search for additional evidence and their assessment of the various arguments were concluded, the masters of the king's court postponed any final ruling. Until that time came, they made a quite interesting interim arrangement. Our unnamed protagonist's parents were dead in 1267. She was an orphan. She had friends, a number of whom were undoubtedly adults, and some of these had compromised themselves by facilitating the, girl, facilitating the girl's departure to the home of Lord Jean de Tilly. However, her parents had had friends too. The masters directed the Bailly of Verneuil to communicate with them, the parents' friends, in order to find out what they knew. The evidence garnered might be useful. These friends could also inform him, that is to say the Bailly, of some person above suspicion. Someone, in other words, who was not a partisan of Nicolas de Blainville or of Jean de Tilly, with whom the girl could live in the interim. That is, until the masters handed down their decision. The judges must have had a profound distrust of Nicholas. But then they were, after all, St. Louis judges. Men, as Professor Davis will know from the lectures I gave in her honor in Budapest, who were consumed with the desire to protect the rights and persons of orphans and other subjects deemed worthy of particular 
solicitude, what in medieval Latin is miserabiles personae, people desire, worthy of mercy. Be that as it may, the master's interim solution probably rang down the curtain on Nicholas de Blainville's hopes. Obtaining a favorable hearing of his petition became less and less likely as days stretched into weeks and weeks into months. A judicial ruling constraining the orphan in the way that Nicholas wished faded as the investigation continued and indeed in tandem with the passing of time during which the unnamed but apparently feisty girl grew ever more definitively and, conf grew ever more definitively and confidently into young womanhood. I suppose, as I earlier mentioned, that money or property of some sort was behind Nicholas's pursuit of the girl in the first place. Or perhaps there was some pre-existing animosity between him and Lord Jean de Tilly that encouraged him to interfere. True or not, like so many petitioners who came to medieval courts ostensibly seeking judicial redress, he decided to settle out of court. Nicholas probably allowed himself to be bought off before his interference lost all prospect of success. And Lord Jean de Tilly did not decline in reputation in the eyes of the crown because of the charges that had been made against him. For one knows, as I also already remarked, that he served on the assizes of Caen in the year after the case of the unnamed girl came to Parliament. So, an analysis of this case, of this case record, it appears, opens a small window onto many issues of interest to medievalists. Gender relations, the vulnerability of orphans, the mobilization and exploitation of networks of friendship, and the operation, sometimes with great sympathy, of the courts. And perhaps more. For there was, after all, one other party alluded to in this dispute, the son of the Lord of Tilly, for whom the unnamed girl was destined to be the future wife. Who was he? His name was also Jean. Typical of northern French aristocratic families, this would make him the oldest son, the eldest son, the one bearing his father's name. It is a manuscript of the miracles of the holy men of Savigny that tells us his name and tells us something about him. The monastery of Savigny was a foundation of the earliest years of the 12th century and the mother house of the congregation of the same name, the whole group of houses of the same name. Eventually, or more especially, more precisely, in 1148, the houses that made up the congregation of Savigny affiliated with the Cistercian order. It was the religious of the mother house at Savigny, Savigny le Vieux, Savigny the Old, in the modern department of the Calvados, who most assiduously cultivated the reputation for holiness of the earliest monks, those whose graves became a pilgrimage site for healing miracles. The shrine was about the same distance from the fief of Tilly as the Lord of Tilly's patronage extended. Traveling to Savigny was no more difficult for Lord Jean, who sheltered the unnamed girl, than it was for him to get to Teville, where, as I earlier mentioned, he possessed the right to appoint the parish priest. If I am right, Lord Jean de Tilly's son was betrothed to the unnamed girl in infancy, but matters were not going well. According to a mid-13th century entry in the Book of Miracles of the Monastery of Savigny, as an adolescent, the boy was brought, grievously ill and seemingly on the point of death, to the monastic shrine in hope of a cure. He was suffering terrible visceral pain. It was, it was, the text goes on, as if his organs were at war in his body. He hungered but was powerless to keep much down, and he grew ever weaker. Even what he did manage to ingest betrayed him, causing problems equally severe, savage, and cruel. It was a wonder that he survived it all. But then again, Savigny's Book of Miracles is a record of just such marvels. I like to think that the wonders continued after the youth's miraculous recovery. Indeed, that they multiplied with his marriage to the remarkably determined yet unnamed young woman at the center of my little story. Would it not be wonderful if her name were Natalie? <laughs> what, what a lovely micro history. Our next speaker is um, Joan Wallach-Scott, who is Professor Emerita, oh, I should stand here, Professor Emerita, 
at the School of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study, where she first arrived in 1978, the same year that Natalie arrived in the School of Historical Studies. Um, and then uh, she came later to become professor in the School of Social Science from, I hope I have these years right, 1985 to 1994. Um, she's the author of many influential works um, and recipient of many awards. I'll just mention one of her most influential, her article, Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis. And I'll also say that I got to know Joan because she was on the advisory board of Women's Studies at Princeton. And many of you in this room were also part of uh, that network of feminist scholars, which uh, Natalie did much to nurture here. Joan. So it's the institute is, I left, I retired at Angela in 2014, not 99. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Historians never get dates right, in my experience. So, so my talk is going to take a different tack. Natalie has been the subject of many interviews in many languages, English, Dutch, Italian, French, German, Spanish, Japanese, Turkish, Serbo-Croatian, Chinese, Korean. What I wondered, what I wondered, would it be like to take those interviews as my historical material for this brief talk? As I read the ones I could in my limited set of languages, I realized that they were rich in detail, full of insight into this remarkable historian, a treasure trove, but of what exactly? What kind of source is an interview? Is there a theory of the interview that would be useful for my deliberation? If you Google theory of the interview, <laughs> you mainly come up with advice about how to get a job. <laughs> There are also one or two articles full of the jargon of the kind of social science I don't do, structured versus unstructured interviews, realist versus pluralist interpretations on how to construct the data obtained by a researcher into prisoners, as one of the cases would have it. There was one article a film scholar referred, to me, referred me to by a woman named Paige Sarlin, who was writing an as yet unfinished book on media representations of interviews which had a useful reminder that, quote, an interview is never simply dyadic. It's always grounded in the triad of interviewer, interviewee, and a real or imagined audience. But helpful as her observations were for thinking the interview in general, it wasn't quite what I was looking for to help me read this specific set of interviews. I finally came up with something of a theory of my own, which reflected, I think, my immersion in the sources listening to the hints and signals they already seemed to contain. My major source turned out to be a set of interviews that the French historian Denis Crouzet conducted with Natalie in 2003, published first in France in 2004, and then in English translation in 2010. In French, the book's title was L'histoire tout feu, tout flamme, all fired up, Entretien avec Denis Crouzet. In English, the title is A Passion for History. Conversations with Denis Crouzet. I realized as I read their terrific observations about living, writing, and making history that Natalie was at once the subject and the object of the historical investigation that these interviews represented. The interviewee, in other words, uses her own history to account for the history she writes. How does a professional historian tell her own history? How does she relate the lives of the others she investigates to her personal life story? What causal connections does she acknowledge or refuse? There was another dimension, too, to my thinking about the interview. Since the notion of self-fashioning was a recurring theme in the conversations with Crusay, I wondered if we could take the interview itself as an exercise in self-fashioning. <coughs> self-fashioning, after all, is exactly a process of constituting oneself as both the subject and the object of the story. Self-fashioning, Natalie tells Crusay about her rebellions against family influences was part of my own experience. Here I wonder if we can hear her playing on the double meaning of the term, referring to her rebellious actions as she constituted her individuality, as well as to the representation of self that emerges in the interview. That representation has to do with performance, a crucial addition to her interpretive practice. Interflu in, influenced by literary scholar friends such as Rosalie Coley and Stephen Greenblatt, Natalie recounts, quote, 
I began to look not only at what was stated or declared in the text, but also at what was suggested through expression, through performance. The interview, I want to suggest, is a form of performance of the self. So what do the interviews tell us about Natalie's self-fashioning? Above all, it is as, as a historian that she presents herself, and one who is unabashedly in love with her subject. As the titles of both the French and English versions reveal, she is all fired up for history. Her passion for the past is at once hopelessly romantic and carefully disciplined. First, the fire. On her initial visit to Lyon, she depicts what can only be called a coup de foudre. Quote, I immediately fell in love with France, the people, their way of living, with their food. From there, it was a continuing love affair with the archives. The words pleasure and excitement to describe learning about the past come up again and again. She is fascinated, delighted, linked by magic threads to people long dead. When she is lonely, she finds consolation in the company of people from the past. The addition of gender to the tapestries she weaves is, quote, a great enhancement of my pleasure. She has a penchant, an appetite for writing lies. As a child fascinated by the stories history had to tell, and then later as a Smith undergraduate, drawn especially to French historians, quote, the joy of discovery climaxed when I read Marx Bloch's Societe Feodale. End of quote. <laughs> Bloch becomes a lasting influence on her, a formative figure. She admires his writing style, his own tragic heroic end, and she identifies with him. Quote, he was Jewish like me. The erotic dimension of history's appeal, this thirst for history, she calls it, is crucial to her self-representation. And this is a longer quote. Historical research has been for me an arena of joy and intellectual passion. I always feel a shiver of anticipation when I enter an archive or a rare book collection. What am I going to find? Is the slave woman I'm looking for finally going to show up on the registers of a plantation? Might I even find her signature, left by her for some special reason and precious to me as a sign that she existed and really could write as her lover claimed she could? What luck I've had to read so many interesting accounts, some moving me to laughter, others curdling my blood, some surprising, others familiar, end of the quote. These objects of love never fail to disappoint and they never fail to arrive. Yet, as I mentioned before, for Natalie, eroticism is tamed by discipline. The gift of pleasure offered up by the past imposes, quote, the obligation to recount their lives with responsibility. Not recount them exactly as they would have done, but in being ever attentive to their statements and their claims. Quote, my preferences and my needs, though present, must not, note the imperative here, determine my historical vision, she tells Cruzet, when he suggests that her pleasure derives from some need to find personal reassurance in her objects of study. She refuses the notion that her subjects appeal to her because they resemble her in some way. Quote, I want to stress very strongly here that good history writing cannot be based on perceived resemblance. And resisting the idea that she, Natalie, finds a fitting predecessor in the Jewish glickle of Hamlin, she tells Cruzet that one's professional goals must not, the imperative again, get in the way of one's role as a historian, but I don't think it happened here. I have good evidence to show that her love of storytelling was not only a Jewish trait, but a widespread interest in 17th century Europe. So Glickel was of her time, not of ours, and it's up to the historian to respect that as she distinguishes between her 21st century understanding and Glickel's. The importance of good evidence and responsibility to it comes up again and again. If Natalie is in love with the past, she is also, in her words, faithful to it. Her love is disciplined by realism, by attention to the signposts that illuminate the road to the past. Encountering those who would describe the writing of history as a form of fiction or only an imaginative game, she resists. We must not abandon our practices of proof. Another quote, I must use my imagination, but it must be nourished by and tightly guided by the sources. She said, and she says this uh, of her need to fill in the silences in the historical record of her trickster traveler, Alwazan Leo Africanus. While she's sympathetic to Depeche Chakrabarti's call to provincialize history, she draws the line on the question of proof, making an important distinction between historical sources and historical proof. We need to multiply the sources, she says, but we have to agree on what constitutes proof. 
quote, we should have a common goal in regard to how we might accept a conclusion as established. Only such commonality enables the critical conversations that keep history moving open to its necessary interpretation and revision. It is in that way that writing about Al-Wazan, she has found, quote, common ground established by the rules of my historian's craft with scholars from the Muslim world. There's no lack of philosophical, of sophisticated philosophy in Natalie's exchange with Crusay, and the tenacity with which she holds to a necessary tension between documents and their interpretation is nuanced and impressive. Quote, I want my speculative jumps to start from a springboard of documentation. She says that a certain style of inquiry results from what the evidence itself required of me. But it's not a kind of mindless empiricism that she practices. Her approach is eclectic. Influenced by Marxism, she is insistent on seeing things relationally. She looks to anthropology not for prescriptions but for suggestions about how to think about culture, symbols, and the play of difference. Quote, I want to push my research as far as I can in order to discover and understand the mental and affective worlds of persons and communities in the past. In approaching the traces and texts they've left me, I'm sim simultaneously helped and constrained by my own subjectivity and abilities. I want to hold on to that tension. The historian's work finally goes on in her head, but I want to always remember the existence outside of me of those traces from people of the past. I want to be a storyteller, not a cannibal. She will not devour those people of the past for her own purposes. Instead, she wants to recount their stories and all of their difference from her and from us. There's a politics in her choice to bring us the manu peuple, to make visible their experiences, their resistances, and especially their resilience. First, of course, she wants to rescue them from the margins, or as Edward Thompson put it, the condescension of orthodox history. Find traces of them in those archives stuffed with information about rulers and their minions, make their lives appealing and colorful in their own terms. That writing she thinks of as a mission, a service, a form of reparation for the long silence and invisibility they have endured. It's not kings and queens, she said, she says, and this is a quote, it's the others who need me. I hope I have served them well. But this reparative history has another dimension to it. The focus on the manu peuple, and especially on their resilience, offers a challenge to all totalizing visions of history, whether it is economic determinism, Foucault's epistemes, or the invocation of evil as an explanation, even for what be, can be seen as demonic acts. Quote, for me, the idea that the final explanation for an event is absolute evil is unacceptable. Unacceptable is in italics. <laughs> Instead, by focusing on people on the margins, she can identify serious disagreements pushing at the edges of reigning paradigms or gnawing from within. These may be lost or foreclosed options for alternative ways of living together or simply inventive ways of dealing with oppression and misrule. They may be dreams partially realized, deferred, or tragically disappointed. The point is they allow us to observe and identify with the human operations of hope. When Cruzet criticizes her work as, quote, a very optimistic history and worries that the pleasure she takes in it will lead her astray, remember all of that erotic stuff in the, in the beginning, Natalie counters firmly that she prefers to think of what she writes as a history of hope rather than op optimistic history. The difference is important. Optimism is cheery faith in inevitably happy outcomes. Hope has to do with belief in alternative possibilities. When Cruzet, pre Cruzet presses her to avow her own disenchantment about the disasters of our contemporary politics, she refuses. My realism is still accompanied by hope, and hope can be nourished by a chastened realism. In one of the only moments of a genuinely universalist claim, Natalie ties her history of hope to the study of human resilience. Quote, I am struck by human resilience and I want to understand its sources. And another quote, even in a complex society with lots of prescriptions, there can, there can be give in the way in which human beings manipulate the prescriptions. I'm interested in where the cracks, where the fault lines are in different societies that shake people up to change things. 
In her firm belief in human resilience, she joins her great humanist ancestors, especially Rabelais, Montaigne, and Marguerite de Navarre. Quote, whenever I have an idea about something happening in 16th century France or an interpretation of some event or expression, I run it by Rabelais and Montaigne. <laughs> when it's about women, she turns to Marguerite. If she finds no whiff of what she's looking for, she rethinks and rechecks and does again what she's been doing. I want to suggest that it's not only that these interlocutors are good observers of their times, but that they share Natalie's humanist concerns, or she shares theirs. They provide her with wisdom, humor, and above all, insight into the human condition at the heart of her own inquiry. For me, she writes, the possibilities of the past invite a commitment to humanity and offer a ray of hope for the future. That ray of hope is leavened with humor, explaining the moments of levity in her remarkable experiments, the conversations she constructs with her women on the margins, the imaginary dialogue between Alwazan and Rabelais. She says that she wanted to introduce, quote, a moment of peace and laughter. These qualities provide hope with a certain comfort and consolation. In her very first interview with Judy Coffin and Rob Harding, published in 1980 in the Radical History Review, Natalie declared her ambition, quote, I want to be a historian of hope. She also acknowledged that she wanted the questions she asked of the past to, quote, be important for political and cultural reasons. She added, this is a residue from the political hopes of my youth. The word residue is important here. It makes no direct connection between her own personal history, the history she writes, and its contemporary political impact. Her love of the past is contingent, neither on its reflections of her own biography nor on its direct relevance to the present. The past she offers us consists not of didactic lessons, but of profound insight into the human condition. It's there that the two strands of Natalie's self-fashioning are joined in the interviews with Cruzet. Her own life story, as she tells it, is one of extraordinary resilience in the face of cultural, social, and political challenges. It is that same resilience that she looks for and finds in the objects of her study. That project, a history that documents the many forms of human resilience, earns her a place in the ranks of her great humanist forebears. And it earns her our enduring gratitude for insisting that even in times of great darkness, the light of hope can continue to shine. Thank you. That was really lovely. Um, our next speaker is my uh, colleague, Tony Grafton, who is the Henry Putnam University Professor of History at Princeton where he's been teaching since the same year as William Chester Jordan. <laughs> I'm dispensing with any more dates. Um, and he actually succeeded William Chester Jordan as what? Did you have a correction, Natalie? Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> he actually succeeded uh, Bill Jordan as director of the Davis Center. Um, he, his accomplishments uh, are too numerous and in too many different fields to cite in any or do any adequacy to at this moment. But I'll just mention among his many accomplishments, I especially admire his work in history of the book, from the footnote to the Winthrop Library. Tony? My goodness, it worked. Uh, it's the irony of history has the only Luddite who is speaking, giving with the PowerPoint. Chicago, that gray city, blooms in May. The flower beds and the trees in Bughouse Square across the street from the Newberry Library were blazing with color in early May 1972. Inside the Great Stone Library, things were not so bright. An academic conference pondered the massacre of St. Bartholomew 400 years after the event. Learned scholars debated the politics that led to the massacre, legation by legation and detail by detail. Graduate students from Chicago and Northwestern, Illinois and Michigan did their best to stay awake. <laughs> Suddenly, black and white turned to color. Natalie Davis came to the podium. <laughs> Where others have referred to documents as if we all had them in front of us, 
She quoted thrillingly from Calvinist and Catholic sermons charged with biblical rhetoric. These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations served their gods. Where others read prosaic texts, very prosaic texts, line by line, Natalie seemed to speak. Where others followed the maneuvers of courtly elites, she took us down into the streets and squares where killing actually took place. Where others described the massacre, and here is where my talk, I think, joins with the previous one, as a kind of contingent catastrophe, perhaps the product of diplomatic miscalculation, she examined the ways in which inflicting violence could seem to be a way of living one's religion, a new and terrifying thought to us all at the time. Graduate students awoke, then they stopped breathing, then they forgot to blink. By recreating the rights of violence with such incomparable drama, Natalie Davis had changed our lives. In one hour, she gave us a blazing new idea not only of a past that we had never seen in the same way, but of what a great historian can do and be. Natalie's been shaping my life and those of so many others ever since. As a colleague at Princeton, she taught my generation and cohorts after us how to help students and junior colleagues, how to stand on principle in an official meeting, firmly but without ever being pompous, how to make a case for teaching new subjects, women, Jews, what a strange idea, and using new approaches to reach them. As a scholar and writer, she showed all of us that one, at least one Natalie, can master an endless series of new subjects, new archives, new languages, new methods, speak and write compellingly about each of them in turn, and make it all look easy. And over the years, in seminars and workshops beyond counting, her battle cry, that's so interesting, <laughs> taught us all that curiosity and patience are the greatest epistemic virtues that a historian can have. A few years ago, Natalie came to New York to deliver a series of lectures and seminars at Columbia University. I sat with two Davis veterans, Moshe Shlukovsky and our late beloved friend, Kristen Gager. We smiled happily as the students who filled the room, Natalie neophytes, stopped blinking, stopped breathing, stopped doing anything so you could have heard a pin drop if anyone had been rude enough to drop one. Then, of course, we did exactly the same. The spell didn't break day after day until Natalie herself turned the last session into a lively precept with 100 participants, a form of magic that no one else I know can perform. So what do you offer the historian who's done everything? Well, happy memories, and there will be a few more of those in a moment, but also a story. Natalie dedicated one chapter of her great book, the book that really transformed social history or society and culture in early modern France, to proverbial wisdom and popular error. And in it, she argued that the erudite scholars who began in the 16th century to compile popular sayings as well as classical adages were really bad at interpreting popular culture. They lacked interest in and respect for the people and the culture that they examined. They portrayed the peasants whom they interviewed as stick figures, caricature yokels. So Laurent Joubert, a prominent and brilliant Montpellier physician, exemplified this ugly process of appropriation and dismissal, though he interviewed peasants endlessly to find out what sorts of remedies they used for one another. He treated them as evidence not of their skills won by hard experience, but of their popular errors and folly. The story completely convinced me, and one memory will show you how fully. When Natalie retired, the Princeton comedy players put on a performance in which characters from Natalie's books confronted her and reproached her for her mistakes. <laughs> Glickel of Hamon complained that Natalie had criticized her Yiddish. <laughs> Maria Sibylla Marion, who arrived with a small pail of gigantic plastic spiders, explained that she had always liked arachnids. Bertrand de Roy, finally, <laughs> explained the, 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 the problem that had puzzled us all for years she had no idea which Martin Guerre was Martin Guerre, since they and she had all had shit all over them. Alas for me, 
I was Laurent Joubert. I arrived a chamber pot on my head. Here is the chamber pot. And all I could say was that the citizens of Montpellier, whom I had bothered to tell me about their remedies, had rightly emptied it over me and chased me away. But still, every story, every analysis is the product of its time, as no one's taught, her, taught us over and over again better than Natalie. Everything is to be done and to be redone. Uh, quite recently, for example, in a wonderful essay on writing the rights of violence, new tellers take the stage, new sources emerge from archives, and gradually new colors emerge in the story. It's not that the earlier one was wrong, it just becomes richer. And what I wanted to offer you, Natalie, today, besides my lifetime of admiration, is a sketch of one direction in which that wonderful argument about scholarly pride and prejudice has moved in recent years, chiefly thanks to the work of scholars younger than me, um, to say nothing of younger than other friends in the room. Here's the informant who materialized from the early modern world of learning. Now, on first acquaintance, John Keyes looks rather like Laurent Joubert, and it's not a delusion that he does. He began academic life as an insignificant scholarship boy whose name his college actually couldn't spell. But he graduated at the top of his year, studied medicine at Padua, where he roomed with Vesalius, and became a rich doctor in London. As president of the Royal College of Physicians, he defended Galenic medicine against the empirics, the street practitioners of Deborah Harkness's London, who offered cheaper and probably better cures than, than he and his colleagues. And he consistently portrayed himself as a staunch defender of traditional learning. In 1555, Oxford gave David Lawton, a brass worker, a doctorate in medicine for his empirical work. The College of Physicians called him in for an examination and asked him with nice humor to decline the Latin word corpus, body. He failed pitifully. As, as Keyes explained, he answered, hic hiken hoc corpus and corporem, not corpus in the accusative. What a splendid university trained doctor to be entrusted with human lives. No more needed to be said. Keyes rebuilt his old Cambridge college, Gonville Hall, and renamed it after himself. And there, too, he defended the old world of humanistic learning against all challengers. When young dons disagreed with them, um, setting a precedent which happily modern university administrators haven't heard about, he put them in the stocks and hit them until they agreed. But he always took care to make clear that he felt nothing but disdain for the vulgus, for ordinary people. In his history of Cambridge, he reflected, in this city there are two estates, scholars and mechanicals, that is, the sun and the shadows. In his account of the 1381 Peasants' War, he described with shuddering horror the terrible day when a mob had burnt the university's archive. A mad old woman, Margaret Stair, gathered the ashes and scattered them to the winds. She cried out, away with the tricks of the clerics, away with them. Such is the madness of the crowd. And I can just hear Natalie saying how great this woman was, and <laughs> do, do we, don't we know more about her? Yet there was another Keyes. In the 1550s and 60s, he corresponded at length with the greatest naturalist of his day, the Swiss Pliny, Conrad Gessner, who was then compiling massive, magnificently illustrated books on the history of animals, fish, birds, and insects. Now, an older generation of historians like to make fun of Gessner for his credulity, his inclusion of imaginary animals. But in the 1980s, William Ashworth, a pioneering historian of science, showed that there was method in Gessner's credulity. His view of nature, Ashworth argued, was not empirical but emblematic. He embedded what he found about animals in a rich, mannerist framework of textual citations, which imbued them with allegorical and philological meanings. These mattered most to him. A newer generation still, and an extraordinarily creative one, Brian Ogilvy, Sachiko Kusakawa, Florica Egmont, and others, have taught us that Ashworth in turn needs to be dethroned. Gessner was, in a period sense, an empirical scholar, even on, an, uh, on a kind of flamboyant scale. He collected images of animals and plants from friends across Europe. He systematically corrected them in later editions. He himself became a skilled artist who drew and, and painted hundreds of images of animals and plants. 
working in his top floor study in Zurich uh, with the light coming through magnificent windows etched with images of fish. He changed his practices, abandoning philology and mythology, abandoning the endless quotations he had loved at first for firsthand information and images of animals and descriptions of their behavior. In the prefaces that celebrated his works, he came to celebrate not only his erudite friends, but the ignorant, citizens, foreigners, hunters, fishermen, hawkers, shepherds, and all sorts of men, whom I repeatedly asked all sorts of questions, uh, a world that Anne Blair has recently explored. No one did more to push Gessner in this new direction than, of all people, Keyes. He sent a flood of material to Zurich for his friend. Images like this lovely image of a puffin, which, uh, which Gessner um, wonderfully introduced into his book. Whole texts, like a little book on English dogs with pictures, which he sent to Gessner, who printed the dogs, but then withdrew the book when Keyes asked him to because it wasn't quite ready. Again and again, Gessner would take Keyes' letters and simply interpolate them into his books. And here, you see he's interpolated into a first edition, a letter which included the phrase, if you'd like, I can send you an image, though you don't really need it. He only thought to take it out while preparing the second edition. <laughs> as, as Anne has shown, Renaissance writers worked the way we did when making web pages, when the web first existed. You scanned anything you had into them. And that's sometimes the way that Gessner worked. Nonetheless, the material he was compiling was the best, the most exigently sieved that he could find. And again and again, Keyes would send him information and corrections of images as well as texts, and Gesner would enter them in his copies of books in order to be sure that the next time he would get everything right, though often the next time never came. Between the letters that Keyes himself preserved, the letters that Gesner interpolated into his books, and the notes that survive in Gesner's working books in the margins, it's possible to piece together a little archive of what Keyes told Gesner. And it turns out that he described his practices as well as his findings in enough detail to give us a strikingly different view of high learning in the late Renaissance. Pamela Long and Pamela Smith have taught us that early modern cities had many trading zones, the phrase they've borrowed and from Peter Gallison, sites like the printing house and the, and the artist's atelier, where people of different social orders and intellectual formation met and talked. Keyes liked these lively places. Unlike Gessner, he lived in a port, for example. So he frequented the docks. There he could buy animals from merchants. There, even more remarkably, he could talk to sailors, whom he asked what a long-tailed <coughs> sheep from Arabia ate and learned. They eat grass, meat, fish, bread, cheese, and anything else, at least when impelled by hunger on shipboard. <laughs> he went out on boats with fishermen and ate the, ate the smaller fish, not the whales that they brought home. It was they who provided him with this magnificent swordfish, which Florica Egmont discovered, and which he supplied to Gesner. Keyes' favorite trading zone, however, was not on the docks and was even more exciting. It was the Royal Menagerie in the Tower of London. This very durable institution, created under King John in the early 13th century, would become the London Zoo in the 1830s. And of course, it still exists. When my wife and I had our first child and were living in Camden Town, we discovered that a sea lion barking half a mile away sounds exactly like a baby crying in the next room. Not everyone knows this. Keyes located many of his descriptions of animals in the tower making clear how well he knew not only the animals but the staff and how readily they confided in him. Describing the ounce, probably a cheetah, he draws a sharp contrast with another fierce beast. Lions can be tamed. I gather this from the fact that in the Tower of London, they let their keepers kiss them, permit them to touch them and play with them. I've seen them myself. The ounces, that's the cheetahs, by contrast, are so fierce that the keeper, when he first wanted to move one of them from place to place, was forced to strike them on a head with a cudgel to make them half dead, as they say, and then to put them in a wooden crate specially made for this, perforated to allow them to breathe, and then to move them. They become conscious again after an hour, like cats, which die only from the most serious wounds. <laughs> the keeper followed the same routine when taking them out of the crate. Uh, it's a bit of grand guignol to be sure, but it is remarkable to see the haughty keys learning and recording the routine of a zookeeper and Gesner duly interpolating this into one of his books. 
Keyes drew more than simple information from the practitioners with whom he chatted. As Marcy Norton has taught us, early modern cities and towns swarmed with animals, animals that worked, animals that entertained, animals that, were, that hunted, animals that were eaten, as well as the humans who made their livings working with them. In his letters to Gesner, Keyes made clear that he frequented every one of these professionals that he could find at every level. Here he tells how a wandering performer, it's a Kirkum Foreus up there, who exhibited an elk, had given him a picture of the elk, which he sent on to Gesner. It was probably the same performer whom Keyes saw in 1564, exhibiting a rabbit that danced, played the drum with its, first, with its front feet, uh, and attacked dogs with its teeth and claws. But uh, he also talked to more serious experts. Gesner published a report from the Scottish humanist Hector Boes about water dogs, dogs that hunt fish through the rocks by their smell. Keyes tells him, I worked very hard at learning about this from fishermen and hunters, but I never found a single one of these dogs. Keyes took a special interest in British shepherds and their, and their dogs. He loved to watch a shepherd whistling through his clenched fist and his dog with no further command, rounding up the sheep and making them do exactly what the shepherd wants. Every time he heard a shepherd's whistle, he tells us, he would rein in his horses wherever he was so that he could see another trial, another experiment. All this time spent with the Volkus changed Keyes. And we can see this from the way he describes animal behavior in lively passages that leap from what are otherwise pretty sedate pages of Latin. Here he describes the Barbary ground squirrel. Some of them were brought to us alive by a merchant from Barbary. We kept them alive and fed them for the sheer pleasure of it. And they're certainly squirrels. Their behavior, their size, their way of life, their voice, agility, the way they use their tails, their manner of sitting upright, and everything else matches. Even more striking is the passage where he talks about his pet puffin. When there was nothing for it to eat, it would beg for food with a natural world that it repeated in a humble tongue. Boopin, boopin. I kept one at my house for eight months. It enthusiastically bit anyone who gave it food or touched it, but in a gentle and innocent way. A very small amount of food was enough to satisfy it. Elsewhere, he says that sheep will drink wine. Unfortunately, they then get drunk. This was a special descriptive language, a formal Latin uniquely inflected with the minute knowledge of details and the passion for animal behavior and personality peculiar to the people who actually worked with animals, huntsmen and falconers, zookeepers and fishermen, the beginning of a language of natural history that would become the normal one in the vernacular works of the 17th and 18th centuries. We see the high humanist changed by his time with the Vulgus. Now, Natalie was certainly right in her original article. Humanists were not ethnographers. They did a really bad job of explicating popular proverbs if what we want from them is knowledge of the cultures that they emerged from. They also, by the way, were not historians, and they did an equally bad job with classical proverbs, which they also wrenched from their contexts and explained in Christian terms, completely alien to their advisors. But this little story, the story precipitated by new generations of scholarship, lets us see that when these scholars hope to gain powerful knowledge, knowledge that could actually help them do things, knowledge that could help them get their fingers into nature, they were more curious than their rhetoric about social orders would suggest, and their own ways of observing and recording what they saw were changed by their discussions with the despised vulgus. Will this conclusion surprise our honoree? Of course not. At the end of Pop Proverbial Wisdom and Popular Errors, she stages a wonderful imaginary dialogue with Laurent Joubert, reproaches him for his contempt, and has him answer, that's not true. I praised the midwife Gervaise who came regularly to public dissections of female corpses at Montpellier. That, in fact, was the clue, Natalie's imaginary dialogue, that set me to wondering again about whether it might be possible to tell another story to complement the one that she told all those years ago. This, I think, exemplifies Natalie's magic perhaps even more than her extraordinary work as teacher, as speaker, as writer. Everything she has done as a scholar still challenges and provokes us and usually suggests the right answer long before we toil our way to it. No thanks are enough, but thank you, Natalie, and happy birthday.
me just shut this off then. Um, our next speaker, oh, I love this terrible noise. Our next speaker this afternoon is Bonnie Smith, who was, um, is the Board of Governors Distinguished Emeritus Professor of History at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Um, we selected her in honor of Natalie's time as Davis Center Director for Bonnie was one of her fellows. Uh, she also has taught at Princeton as a visiting professor on occasions. She's a renowned scholar of France, of women's history, and I'll mention just one of her many influential books, The Gender of History, Man, Women, and Historical Practices. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, we had a lot of fun at the Davis Center with Natalie, but not never too much fun. And so I'm going to read a very serious paper um, just in honor of our sobriety. Um, <laughs> one question uh, directed at the latest iteration of women's history in, during the late 1960s and even down today is, where is the power? This challenge, posed by those who claimed that history was essentially about charting power, sent historians of women scrambling in the 1970s and early in the 1980s. There is not time to go through the resulting sightings of women's power in, for example, unions, food protests, charitable activities, and the many forms of activism, abolitionism, civil rights, suffrage, socialism, communism, and reform politics. They had been queens regnant, behind the scenes influencers, assassins, resistors, warriors, and on and on. Exceptional idea, women, the idea went, had in fact wielded power. Natalie Zeman Davis's first book, Society and Culture in Early Modern France, appears on the surface to follow that quest for acts of power in essays such as Women on Top or in her work on influential women printers. We fast forward uh, 20 years to Women on the Margins, Three 17th Century Lives. Her quest there seems to be different, or at least appears to be so in interviews and writings during the intervening years in which, uh, <clears throat> in which she discusses the, quote, the variety of ways of being a woman, unquote. Indeed, in scrupulous archival detail that almost everyone has mentioned so far, Another announced but also obvious passion of hers, she chronicles the lives of three very different women, quote, on the margins, as part of her historical engagement with and portrayal of individuals. For Davis, the margins are important spaces in history, national and world history, or otherwise. People at the margins are flexible, she announces in her study, and given their character and positioning on the margins, they could take advantage of opportunities. At the margins, there may be fewer constraints and social conventions that one has to follow. Um, although people at the margins confront problems, as the heroines of Davis's story did, they soldier on and work to find emotional and other resources that others might not. They develop skills and fortify themselves with them, even to the point of interfering in other people's lives. They thus prepare themselves for whatever may threaten to upset their life course and goals. Simultaneously, there are fewer rules on the margins and often fewer constraints, opening the way 
to creativity, even as spiritual strengths also fortified them. In the case of Gluckel, uh, of Hamlin, Marie de l'Incarnation, and Maria Sibella Marion, personal creativity and doggedness outside central constrained and elite society allowed them into the world, his, onto the world history stage. The Queens of France could not go off to live with Native Americans in Canada, nor could they sail away to Suriname to draw plants and insects. No matter how creative they might have been, <clears throat> they are more constrained. Lives at the margins are full of texture, which may not be the same as wielding, wielding power. Let's see about that. <clears throat> Davis emphasizes border crossings, fluidity of identity, and self-fashioning in her writings on the large cast of individuals who comprise the subject, uh, subjects of her extensive oeuvre. There are, in women's history, those who might be included only by crossing borders mentally or symbolically, or by self-fashioning, uh, Chinese women, for example, who self-fashioned by borrowing the practice of foot binding from, perhaps, Persian dancers, or who <coughs> excuse me, wove silk for trade on the Silk Road, or the river merchant's wife who imagines the travels of her husband as well as his return. 18th century African women, both slave and free, grew crops and invented new varieties of produce from plants around the globe, thus crossing, um, thus crossing borders, though they might remain stationary. The, the, these went to feed African slave armies fighting neighboring kingdoms. Women captured for the, for the trade are said to have transported seed in their hair or their children's hair or otherwise on their person or seizing it from ship stores and then composing what one historian has called truly, quote, botanical wonders, unquote, in the distant Caribbean or South America. Davis would consider these supposedly marginal activities as stemming from a positioning beyond the historical centers of power. And in the case of Chinese and African uh, women may be, may be considered as functioning on the margins of the margins as the most ordinary of people. How would she, how did she, would she connect these people to power? In her first book, Davis showed ordinary marginal people, journeymen and others, wedded to ritual, hanging out, enforcing social rules, while also fluidly creating new identities as Protestants, for example. We can also see Chinese behavior as shaped by ritual intertwined with um, gender, constantly enacting and perpetuating gender order, while also leading lives riddled with fluidity. Studies of Chinese women, for example, find that there was no universal word for woman, women in the Chinese language until late in the 19th or early 20th century. Instead, there was sister, mother, wife, and so on, each one defined by relationships themselves constructed on following rules, rituals, and other practices associated with the term mother, wife, and so on. Suddenly, though, they are, quote, women, unquote. The Chinese example suggests that there is little in a female being inhabiting this social world that is determined by biology. Fluidity, as Davis would have it, always rears its head. In another example, Jesuits residing in China, and actually in other parts of the world, sent accounts of gendered relations and other social behaviors, definitely more refined than those of most Europeans at the time, back to the continent where they were widely translated and published. In them was the story of Mencius's mother, and the behavior she demanded for her son and those she demanded for herself. 
It was after these writings became popularized that Europeans fluidly reshaped motherhood as encompassing the nurturing and raising their children to be responsible, not simply well-connected adults. The fluidity that 1970s historians took for women's eternal um, uh, sta status. Motherhood in the West was shaped by a new set of behaviors and practices crossing borders and women, those people on the margins, refashioning themselves. Rousseau's reading notes on the history of women worldwide show that in the West, the rules and rituals of modern motherhood stemmed from other cultures as they reshaped global practices, fostering new options in self-fashioning. Played out at the margins, gender is, taken for, is a taken for granted way of life that has transcended boundaries as part of its fluidity. As Davis finds her women full of distinct characteristics and a range of self-fashioned attributes, she takes on another objection to women's history, that united by female reproductivity, women had no history beyond the body, or alternatively, the family, as a great Princeton historian said many decades ago. <laughs> Still, some women seemed directly to wield power and were not simply marginal. They regularly carried out rule-based negotiations in among, uh, among southeastern states and among those of Africa to enact and compose the shared world. They were also were especially capable and sex successful in both local and international trade, eventually in the 20th century becoming politically forceful in decolonizing efforts, though understood by whites as marginal. I cite here the Nigerian market women's organizations that both organized the so-called ABBA Women's War of 1929 and the post-war activism that helped Nigeria gain its independence from Britain. All of these by uh, those seen as marginal persons. The above mentioned cases suggest the world history importance of these figures despite the denial of their relevance in understanding the large processes of what are called world systems and the power embodied therein. However, when discussing women on the margins, Natalie Davis did not call them powerful. That is, she did not call the three women in her study powerful. Instead, she said that, quote, power flowed through them, unquote. And to me, this is one of the most important insights, well, because I'm a historian of women, um, uh, in her, all of her, in her work. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say it's the most important. It is, it's a magnificent um, articulation, a historical articulation. This flow of power through individuals appears obvious in the case of the Egyptian and Hittite queens correspondence um, that people use a lot to understand women's diplomatic positioning, or in the adept negotiations of Southeast Asian women diplomats. Davis's protagonists, however, were hardly so highly born or recognized as internationally important at the time. She shows their power as life force, or as competencies, or as worldly energy in their lives, or the infusions of white and, or other power directing their actions. Dwelling on this earth was a matter of life practices, rules, and competencies um, that we see so in such beautiful detail in um, almost everything she writes. And it's a broader uh, international power creating European knowledge and wealth-based dominance coursing through their lives. The history written, for example, by the aunt of Akbar, the Mughal emperor, emperor uh, who reveals the power of institutional religion and dynasties surging through women of the Mughal court as they handle women from 
uh, other regions wanting a place in the court and striving to become the mother of the next emperor. Mary Wortley Montague, uh, wife of the British ambassador to the Ottoman court, famously took the knowledge of inoculation from Istanbul back to London in her letters, becoming in the process a conduit uh, of scientific knowledge as power. However, what about power flowing uh, through the lives of the Jean de Peu, that is, uh, uh, I'm referencing a book by Sanso of the same name, that intertwined more ordinary people with one another, even those who were victims. Women's voices of victimhood and occasional triumph were heard during the Manchu takeover of China in the 17th century. The verse of Shang Jing Lan, the, uh, the verse and biographies of Wang Duan Shu are still conduits of power, not just that of the author, but that of the family and of the state. Thereafter, Chinese women's adherence to cultural rules advanced the interests of defeated families in poetry and sustained families imperiled by political revolution. These poems passed among women and across families as a kind of rule-based performance of power, crossing household boundaries, moved uh, through their poetry and formed invisible networks, as did that of Ottoman women uh, poets uh, writing almost simultaneously. These networks that are uh, through which political po the politics of poetry is coursing in these societies. Inhabiting the margins, women did not go out in public and read their works aloud, seeking acclaim. Yet the poetry indicated life force, conducting power across uh, household and imperial thresholds as women fluidly refashioned themselves, ultimately reaching a world stage in our times. The processes of foot binding and of creating the dainty shoes cemented sexual intimacy, testifying not only to powerful gendered structures, but also highlighting resistant power resonating from the margins of the Manchu conquest and binding its women and other opponents in a common web. In sum, the scholarship of Natalie Davis, just from this one little example, provides us with new and critical understandings of power and individuation as she merges structural exigencies with human capacities. Across her own life, her own beautiful life, uh, flows the power of intellectual fluidity, of character and generosity, of mentoring and extraordinary uh, scholarly verve. With gratitude, we try to emulate the richness of that power in our own lives and work. Thank you, Natalie.